Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Entrepreneurial Strategy Series. Uh, this is a uh, presentation. Uh, this is a virtual uh, kind of event that we put on usually the last Thursday of every month. We've been doing it for the last three years. My name is David Postalski. I am an intellectual property attorney, a patent attorney, and a partner at Gerhardt Law. And we are the ones that kind of put these uh, uh, sessions on. It is all about educating and empowering uh, uh, entrepreneurs, startups, emerging companies on all the different things that affect your journey. Uh, for, I've been practicing for about 20 years and most of my clients, like I said, are startups and entrepreneurs. And most of those teams are built of people that are based in various places around the world. So maybe one team member is in the U.S. and another team member is in Israel or India or Korea or whatever. And um, so usually there comes a point in that journey where um, where where all the founders or all the uh, all the integral uh, people that make up the company want to be in one place at the same time. And so the first question I normally get when I when I'm working with international founders or mixed companies with international founders is, uh, do you know any uh, um, good immigration attorneys, right? And so, so I was like, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. And I know two awesome ones who we are gonna present to you today. I'm super excited. They both agreed to do this, but I think you're gonna learn a lot from them. I first wanna introduce uh, uh, Krishna Palagumi, and then Ronnie will then Ronnie, you can you can introduce yourself after that. And then the two of you can, uh, you know, kind of share your presentations, which everybody got a little sneak peek on. So, Krishna, please welcome. Hi, uh, thank you, David, uh, for the opportunity. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Krishna Palagumi. Um, I'm an immigration attorney based in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, I've been practicing immigration law for close to two decades now. Uh, my focus is primarily business immigration. Um, and then we also do uh, a little bit of family immigration, but it's predominantly corporate slash business immigration. And I work with a lot of clients from you know uh, various countries, uh, help them immigrate to US on a temporary basis on work visas, uh, but we also help them with uh, immigrating to US on a permanent basis, which is you know apply for green cards and path to you know naturalization citizenship in the US. Um, that's about me. Uh, and so the way we'll uh, use our one hour of time here uh, in a productive way is to try to talk about various visa options uh, in the non-immigrant and the immigrant side, and I'll explain what they mean. Um, but we'll try to keep it inf informal. Um, you know, we'll have David um, ask any questions from the chat, and uh, we'll also open up the, uh, you know, the session for uh, live FAQs or you know, any questions that you guys have, like a QA. and a um, and that will help you, uh, you know, uh, with the whole uh, immigration, uh, in terms of the immigration options for you. Uh, what we mean by non-immigrant versus the immigrant is non-immigrant visas typically mean a temporary visa to come to the U.S., either to work in the U.S. Uh, or to uh, pursue education or to come as an exchange visitor. Uh, you know, there are various non-immigrant visa options. Uh, but then when we talk about immigrant visas, we're talking about the green cards, um, uh, whether it's a family-based green card or an employment-based green card. So we're essentially talking about uh, green cards when we talk about the immigrant visas primarily. So our um, well, how Rani and I are going to handle this is I'm going to predominantly handle the non-immigrant visas part of the discussion. And Rani, when she joins, will uh, address the immigrant uh, visa part of the immigrant visas, meaning the green cards part of the discussion. And then we'll have uh, Q&A in between. So uh, so we go, we're going to talk about uh, non-immigrant visas uh, 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 to start with. Um, so the first thing is H-1B visas. You probably heard of it. Uh, H-1B is a type of a work visa to work in the U.S. It's a specialty occupation visa which means the position typically requires uh, uh, at least a bachelor's degree uh, in a field uh, that's related to the position for which you are applying uh, in terms of the job. Um, uh, just an example, uh, a software engineer uh, with a computer science bachelor's degree, that would be a bachelor's degree in computer science directly related to um, you know, the uh, software engineer job. So there is a direct correlation. 
And that's pretty much what we are talking about in terms of uh, specialty occupation, the position requiring a bachelor's degree or, or higher in a related field. Um, H-1B process involves, uh, it's a two-step process. Uh, initially, the employer, the U.S. employer applies for a labor condition application, um, which is also known as an LCA. Um, and uh, once the labor condition application is certified uh, with U.S. Department of Labor, the employer then goes ahead and files the H-1B petition with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. That's the immigration agency within the U.S., uh, and we, we call them uh, USCIS. Uh, most of the immigration petitions gets, uh, they get filed with the USCIS. Um, with regard to the H-1B, there is an uh, annual uh, limit on how many visas uh, the U.S. government access, accepts in a given year. Um, there is an annual uh, cap of 65,000 visas um, uh, each year available for, for the whole world, out of which 6,800 visas uh, are specifically allocated to nationals of Singapore and Chile. We'll get to that in a second, but um, the regular annual cap is 65,000 visas. And then there is an advanced degree uh, cap, uh, meaning people with a U.S. Uh, master's degree or higher are specifically allocated uh, an additional 20,000 visas. So there are two uh, numerical limits. There is a 20,000 U.S. master's or higher uh, uh, cap, and then there is a regular cap of 65,000. And um, each year, uh, the number of applicants are far higher than the uh, available numerical limits. And, and it's almost like seven is to one uh, ratio in terms of like one visa uh, allocation. Uh, and there are seven applicants uh, for that. So there is typically like a lottery system uh, that ha happens around uh, uh, March or April of each year. Uh, and the employers uh, apply their registrations in the, uh, in the H-1B lottery. And then the USCIS notifies uh, if their cases are getting selected in the lottery. Mm -hmm. They have like the first round, which is in March or April. And then the second round, if there is, that normally happens around July or August time frame. So that's with regard to the H-1Bs. David, you have any questions before I move to the next one? Uh, hang on a second. No, but Ronnie, can you can you just turn your camera on? Ronnie's here. Yeah, she's here on her iPhone. Okay. I think I'm good. Okay. Um, so hang on one second. Where are you, Ronnie? I don't think I see you. She's on the... You see me? Yeah, now I see you. Hey, Ronnie, okay. can you maybe... So so sorry about all the computer problems you're having. Um, yeah, not sure, I was not. not. Sure. And, I know, and, I don't um, understand what happened, but regardless, the show must go on. Can you Absolutely. maybe take a minute and introduce yourself to everybody? And then Krishna will go back to his, uh, his uh, presentation. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Attorney Ronnie Imandi. I am Chin, hosted by David, and uh, I have about 28 years of immigration experience in relation to green cards and uh, work visas and immigrant investor visas. So we, I am here today to talk about the green cards. This way, you all would be informed about the right ways to secure a permanent green card in the United States, either through an employer or through, uh, or, or personally through uh, potentially yourself. So there are different options for that. And I'm gonna discuss that today for you. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you so much. Krishna, go for Thank it. You. Yeah. So uh, you were just talking about the H-1B visa. You can still see the screen, right? Yeah, you can still screen. It's smaller again, but it's fine. Leave it. The, the challenge is if I put it in the presenter mode, it's I, I can't see the Zoom screen. That's fine. That's I don't fine. Know. Something's going on there. <laughs> um, the next visa, so we, we just talked about the H-1B visa, and we briefly talked about the visa allocation for Singapore and Chile, 6,800 visas. This is what it is, as you can see on the screen. Um, H-1B-1 is a, is a separate, it's the same requirements in terms of the bachelor's degrees required, uh, and it should be in a related uh, field that's related to the position for which you're applying for a job. Um, all of the requirements are precisely the same as H-1B. Uh, 
um, the fundamental difference between uh, H1B1 and H1B is there is a separate allocation of 6,800 visas within the within the H1B uh, numerical cap of 65,000 each year. And, and as you can see on the screen, uh, the 6,800 visas are broken down into 5,400 visas for nationals of Singapore, and then 1,400 visas are allocated for nationals of Chile. And, and what that means is, um, you know, even if there are uh, thousands of applica applicants applying for the job, if you have a, a, a Singapore passport or a Chile passport, you will be counted in a separate uh, uh, allocated uh, H1B1 category. So that's pretty much what it means. Um, and before we move to the next visa category, I do want to mention, I want to switch to the previous screen, and I want to mention that, uh, as you can see here, on a H1B, you normally get an approval for an initial period of three years, and then the employer applies for an extension uh, for three more years, typically, so you get a maximum of six years on a H1B. Um, there are ex extensions possible beyond six years if you, uh, if you have an ongoing green card process, um, for, for instance, you know, if your employer sponsored an em employment-based green card for you, or, or even if you have a family-based green card at a certain stage, you might be eligible, um, you know, uh, for, a, for a H-1B uh, extension beyond, uh, uh, beyond six years. And, you know, different conditions apply for that, but that's, you know, without going too much into the detail, you are eligible for H-1 extension beyond six years if you meet certain conditions with regard to and the ongoing green card. And and and, and Krishna, just to, just to add, just so so just so that I just so that we all understand, so the maximum time that you can stay in 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 America with an H one B is six years. You said that's the maximum. If they that's don't the have maximum. an ongoing, if they don't have an ongoing green card process, which reaches a certain stage, then the you know the six year maximum you gotta uh, go. amount of yeah. time ends, and they'll have to leave the country for one year outside the country before they apply for a fresh H-1B lottery and the number and all of that. Got it. And, and one, uh, one year time outside the U.S. essentially resets the clock. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. And, and, and uh, what about if the, if, what about it? What about if the person has children or is married? Like, like, are they coming on their visa with them? Great question. Uh, children, spouse and children uh, can apply for what is called a H-4 dependent visa. Uh, their stay in the U.S. is entirely dependent on H-1B uh, employees' uh, employment status in the U.S. Uh, so the, mm -hmm. under certain conditions, the H-4 dependent spouse could apply for a work permit. If the, if the, if the H-1B spouse or if the H-1B employee has a green card uh, at a certain stage, the H-4 dependent spouse could apply for a, for a work permit. Children cannot, but, uh, you know, H-4 spouse can apply for a work permit. And God. Uh, okay. as far as children are concerned, 21 and under are eligible for a H-4 dependent visa. Okay. So, I mean, it does look like if you, if you, if you have, if you have an advanced degree, you have a, you have a better shot at coming to the States for sure. Uh, well, advanced degree from a U.S. university. Ah, got it. Okay. It has to it has to be a U.S. master's or higher. Got it. Okay. You could be, you could be outside the country. Uh, let's say you have a master's degree from U.S. and you're now living in Spain for the last fifteen years. You're still eligible for the U.S. master's cap because you have a U.S. master's. You know that's like fifteen years old. It doesn't matter as long as you have a U.S. degree. You you have two shots at the lottery system as opposed to one. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the the difference between the H-1B and the H-1B-1 is if you have a Singapore or a, or a Chile uh, passport, uh, you apply for a H-1B-1. Um, but they, you know, this, is the, this is the thing. Uh, there is no limit of six years. You can apply for uh, renewals on a yearly basis uh, indefinitely. You can be on a H-1B-1 uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the U.S. on a long-term basis and keep on applying for extensions. So long as you have an employer that's willing to sponsor you for the for the work permit. Okay. Right? Yeah. So the next visa category is is some of you might be interested in this. Uh, we'll talk about L1 visas. Uh, unlike H1B, there are no numerical limits on a, on an L1 visa. So L1 visa can be categorized into two subcategories: L1A and then L1B. Let's talk about L1A um, and then we'll move to the L1B. 
L1A visa is available for uh, executives and managers um, you know, within a given company. I'll give you an example. If you have uh, your company in Spain or Argentina and, you're, uh, and you want to establish an office in US or you already have an office in US, we're talking about a parent subsidiary or, or both companies are owned by uh, you know, the same shareholder or the same group of shareholders, you could transfer your employees from your overseas entity into the US entity on an L1 visa. So that is, uh, that is the flexibility of um, you know, uh, people, uh, mobilizing people from uh, overseas entities into the US. And there are certain requirements for that. Uh, and as far as L1A is concerned, uh, let's talk about an example. Uh, you have a project manager working within your company um, in Argentina, and he's, he's uh, building a certain product for you. Uh, you can essentially sponsor that individual to come and work in the US, uh, provided that individual has worked in your company abroad for at least one year, and, um, and, and he's holding the position of a project manager, either managing a team or managing an essential function within the company, you can potentially sponsor uh, an L1A visa for this, for this person. And L1 visa is typically, especially L1A, is granted for a period of three years initially, and you can apply for extensions in two-year increments twice. So it's three plus two plus two, a total of seven years. So that's the L1A. Dependents, spouse and children can apply for uh, L2 dependent visa. Uh, the interesting thing is, unlike H1B, L1, uh, L1 uh, spouses uh, dependent, the L2, can apply for, uh, is automatically work authorized as soon as they enter the country. They don't even have to apply for a work permit. They enter the US on an L2 visa, they, they are work authorized. And they can pretty much work for any legal entity within the US uh, using that work permit. So, um, and the children under 21 can apply for a L2 visa as well. Um, there are certain limited circumstances in which a L1 um, a, uh, you know, employee can stay beyond seven years. Again, if they have a green card at a certain stage, um, you know, they're in the final step of their green card, that might probably allow them to stay beyond seven years. But it's, it's very uh, restrictive in terms of, um, you know, how long they can stay in the country beyond seven years, right? So that's with regard to the L1A. Um, now, L1B is a specialized knowledge employee category. Remember, we talked about L1A, which is a manager or an executive, meaning you're talking about a CEO of a company or a CFO or a project manager managing a team or an essential function. L1B is, is more for people with specialized knowledge. Um, we're talking about like a software engineers or a product engineers uh, that have very unique knowledge of a product that your company builds or, or unique services that you're offering to your customers. So this individual that you want to transfer to US has that unique specialized knowledge of your product or your service and or has an advanced knowledge uh, uh, of your company's processes or procedures. Um, if, if this individual has been working for you for at least one year outside the US, you can apply for a L1B uh, for this individual to come to the US on a uh, three year uh, initial employment period. Uh, beyond three years, you can apply for a L1B extension for one more time uh, for a maximum of two years. So that's a total of five, three plus two, a total of five years of L1B stay in the US. Again, same as L1A, dependents, spouse and children uh, are authorized to get L2 visa and uh, L2 spouse uh, is uh, work authorized uh, as soon as she enters the country, he or she enters the country. Any questions, David? No, I think we're good. I mean, I, 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 I probably want you to just kind of go through it all so that, so that, so that we can turn to Ronnie at some point. Yeah, I was, I was going to actually ask Rani if, uh, if you want to add anything. Um, no, no, I think uh, everything is great. You're giving a perfect explanation, and um, I think that's great so far because, you know, yep. Yeah. What so, you, David, any questions? Did you want us to... Um, no, I, no, 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 I think okay. we're good. Just like in the interest of time, maybe we, we should just kind of get through it. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Just and, so that. And while we're discussing H1 and L1, it's very important to note uh, I normally uh, I don't talk about 
politics when I talk about uh, immigration, but it's important to understand that immigration is a political lightning rod, uh, unfortunately. And I will share another screen with you to look at the stats. And uh, Rani, you can probably share your feedback on that. Uh, are you able to see? Sure. Uh, yes, the uh, we can see it. The denial rate. You can see that? You can see the screen, right? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So here's the here is a screen that talks about the denial rates. As you can see, uh, before the Trump administration, the denial rates were in in teens or single digits. But as you can see, from fiscal year 2017 all the way to 2021, um, you know these four years, you can see the denial rates of the H1B. They have really you know like significantly increased in terms of uh, you know and then. Once the Biden administration came into being, you know, they, once they took over in 2021, you see the denial rates have significantly dropped to four and two. Same thing with L1B. Um, you can look at the denial rates. Uh, L1B. Oh. L1, uh, L1 typically has a higher denial rate than H1, generally speaking. But as you can see in the, in the Trump years, the Trump era, you see the denial rates uh, are in the high 20s and low 30s. Uh, are in the high 20s and... Right, so, and then as you can see the last, uh, you know, the four quarters of the 2021, the first quarter still in the uh, post Trump era, uh, 32%, but then they slowly started coming down in the third and the fourth quarter of the 2021. Um, but this is what it is. Uh, a lot of a lot of adjudications with whether whether it's H1Bs or L1s or any type of adjudications are driven by the uh, uh, you know the ad administration that's in the uh, White House. Uh, you know, it, immigration is the whole immigration policy is driven by the uh, the administration that's that's in in power at, at any given point of time. Um, yeah, you but, know what, Krishna, I would say also the same holds true for like intellectual property and stuff like that as well. Yeah, um, basically um, uh, kind of uh, uh, changes in law to like intellectual property are usually decided by Supreme Court judges and Supreme Court judges are usually appointed by the president. And so, yes, this uh, this makes perfect sense for sure. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, I do want to uh, add that. I, sorry, Krishna, can I just say something? I do want to add that yeah. uh, I absolutely agree. The statistics are, are, are absolutely on point because uh, definitely on, it's, a, it's a fact. Under the Trump era, we really did have uh, Yeah, Ronnie, you're breaking up. Then you your, had your, Ronnie, your connection is terrible. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Can you hear me okay now? Better now, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so maybe when I speak a little slower. Um, so what I was mentioning is that in the era under the Trump administration, we definitely saw a great deal of a rise in incidents of uh, H-1B uh, denials and or requests for evidence, even though the law had not changed. And it was just simply a policy administration shift to definitely slow down immigration. And then similarly uh, under the Biden administration, we've seen just, you know, it's going back to normal where we're getting those approvals pretty much all the time. So that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Ronnie. So moving on to the next visa category, uh, uh, we'll talk about e-visas. There are three subcategories in e-visas, E1, E2, and E3. Uh, let's talk about the e-visa, uh, E1. Um, E-visas are typically available for uh, for nationals of certain treaty countries that have a treaty with the United States. Uh, currently, there are about, I would say, 60, approximately 60 countries that have treaties with the United States um, that are eligible for an E-1 and an E-2. Uh, E-1 visa is available for treaty, trader, uh, treaty traders, uh, meaning you are uh, in the business of selling a product or a, or a, or a service and uh, you know you belong to the treaty country for example if you're a citizen of uh, let's say italy and you want to move to us and you're selling uh, you know certain products uh, in, in in your own country and you want to start the business in the us 
uh, you're absolutely uh, uh, eligible to apply for a E1 uh, visa and uh, start a company in the US. Uh, but the requirement for an E1 is not only should the country have a treaty with the United States, the uh, business owners of the US entity should also be majority owned by the same uh, country as the treaty. For example, 50% uh, of 50% uh, or more of the treaty country, E1 treaty country should be from the same uh, nationality as the uh, uh, as the uh, uh, the treaty. Uh, and uh, individuals from different countries cannot apply for a uh, for a E1 treaty. Uh, uh, for example, in uh, E1 uh, treaty trader uh, from Italy cannot sponsor a uh, E1 visa for somebody from Spain because the company is majority owned by an Italian or, or a group of Italians. So that's pretty much the E1. Um, spouses and children again are eligible for uh, dependent visas. Uh, uh, spouses are eligible to work upon their entry into the U.S. just like uh, L2 dependents. They don't need a separate work permit, so to speak. Um, E2 visa is for investors. Uh, substantial investment needs to be made in the U.S. Uh, there is no uh, magic number. There's no million dollars need to be invested or anything like that. But the investment should be significant uh, within the in, within the company and should be uh, uh, proportional to the overall size of the company. Um, there is no requirement uh, that uh, the individual uh, that's investing in the U.S. should have substantial trade with the same co same country from where he's coming from, because it's not a treaty E1 treaty visa uh, treaty trader. This is a treaty investor. Um, same requirements as the uh, E1. Spouse and children are eligible for a dependent visa. Spouses are eligible to work in the U.S. Uh, incident to their status, meaning as soon as they enter the country. So, Krishna, I have a question on that. Yes. Um, so, if a foreign investor wants to apply for the E one for the E two, right, the the actual yes. E two one, um, do they have to prove to the United States government that they are, you know, that that they have a certain net worth? Because in the states, you know, there are you know, categories of investors, what we call accredited investors. These are people with yeah. like high net worth and like, you know, make a certain amount of money uh, um, a year and have assets totaling, you know, X amount of dollars. I'm just curious if an investor wants to apply for the E2 uh, um, visa, do they have to prove to the government that they that they have money? It's uh, They have to prove that the company uh, for which they are willing to come should uh, ah. have the sufficient... Uh, funds to sponsor the E1, uh, I'm sorry, an E2 visa. Uh, they don't need to have a certain net worth, uh, so to speak. Uh, let's uh, just, just uh, let's take an example. If you want to start a company in the US and the overall investment in the company, uh, the seed capital, let's say is $100,000. If you are, if you're able to prove that you're one of the shareholders and mm -hmm. you're contributing about $40,000 in this 100,000 right. company, that's substantial as far as I'm concerned because you no, know, it's a good chunk of money. It Got doesn't it. have to be like a you know. There's no uh, so so there's no dollar amount so to speak. You know. Got there's it. No okay. sort of like, but but the individual should also have the. Uh, I mean, when you say net worth, there, there's no magic number, but the investment should be substantial in proportion to the overall size of the company. Got I mean, it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, moving on to the third subcategory of the e visa, this was created fairly recently, and uh, E3 uh, visa is like a H1B, but specifically for Australians, right? So if you have an Australian passport, you are eligible for a E3 visa, uh, and uh, same requirements as H1B, bachelor's degree at the very minimum. Uh, it should be in a related field for which the job is being applied. You know, the position and the education should have a correlation. So same requirements as H-1B. Uh, spouses and children are eligible for their dependent visas. And uh, spouse of an E-3 visa holder is eligible to work in the U.S. Uh, as soon as he or she enters the country. Right. And the interesting thing with E-3 is there's no need to file a petition uh, with the USCIS. Uh, let's say if the uh, if the uh, employee is outside the U.S. in Australia or any other country holding a uh, Australian passport, you apply for a labor condition application. It gets approved in seven days. 
you send the labor condition application and the petition support letter and the offer letter and so on and so forth to the individual. They schedule an appointment at a U.S. consulate and obtain the E3 and they arrive in the U.S. There is no filing the PT, uh, filing of the petition with the USCIS. However, if the individual is in the U.S. in a, in a different visa category and they want to change to E3, you have the option to file a petition with the USCIS so you don't have to leave the country to go to a U.S. consulate and come back in. Right, so that flexibility is there. It's a it's a grossly underused visa compared to H one B. Um, we do have a you know handful of Australian uh, employees for which uh, in, I mean for our clients that we sponsor E three. Um, you know again uh, indefinite renewals. You can apply for any number of renewals. There's no limit on it. Unlike H one B, which maxes out at six years, right? And uh, I'm sorry if I'm Rushing through, we're all already at twelve forty. I want to give Rani enough time to cover the green cards. Yeah, no, uh, it's great. Thank you. And let's briefly talk about the TN. Uh, TN visa is a, is uh, specifically uh, available for Canadian and Mexican nationals. If you have a Canadian passport or a Mexican passport, you can apply for a TN visa. Um, it's not available. There are certain designated occupations for which you can apply for a TN. And, and uh, you know, it's all in the USMCA treaty, uh, as you can see, US-Mexico-Canada agreement um, that lists all the occupations, an engineer, a business management analyst, and so on and so forth. If you fall in one of those categories you, and you have a sponsoring employer in the US, you can potentially apply for a T and visa if you have a Canadian passport or a Mexican passport. The difference between the two, uh, uh, you know, the K Canadian and the Mexican TN is the Canadian TN doesn't need, they don't need a visa in the passport, meaning they don't have to go to the consulate. The employer provides the sponsorship documents. They just show up at the border, at the port of entry. They get the TN stamped in the passport, they enter the country. On the other hand, the Mexican nationals will have to apply for a visa at a U.S. consulate and then enter the U.S. on a TN. That's the difference between the two. Uh, dependents are eligible to get a, a dependent visa. Um, I believe there is no work authorization for dependents or the spouses of a TN visa holder. Um, Rani, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's that's my understanding. Um, and the last visa category is not exactly a work authorization, but this is, you already probably know this, it's a B1, uh, B2 visa category. B1 is for business visitors who want to arrive in the US on a very temporary basis. We're talking about weeks to months, sometimes even days. You have a trade show or you have a business meeting in the US or you want to meet potential clients in the US. You are eligible to apply for a B1 visa to come to US purely for the business purposes. Um, uh, keep in mind, if you are one of the uh, designated uh, visa waiver uh, countries, uh, there are about, I would say, 30 countries or so. You don't need to apply for a visa at a U.S. consulate. You can simply show up uh, at the port of entry. Uh, of course, you have to complete the ESTA requirements and all of that. And then you arrive in the country uh, and you are limited in 90 days maximum on a visa waiver program. On the other hand, if you have a visa stamp in the passport, a B-1 visa stamp, you are eligible uh, to uh, request a longer stay beyond 90 days. Sometimes extensions are possible for valid reasons, uh, but you have to demonstrate that and you need to file an extension application. Um, similar to B-1, B-2 is a tourist visa uh, to arrive in the U.S. Uh, for uh, temporary uh, tourist purposes um, uh, or you know, if you have like a medical uh, treatment that you want to undergo or, uh, or any uh, other reason uh, such as like a travel within the U.S., you can apply for a B-2 visa. Uh, again, if you are one of those visa waiver countries, you can arrive in the U.S., without having the need to apply for a visa stamp at a U.S. consulate. Uh, that's pretty much the whole uh, non-immigrant visas I wanted to discuss. I'm sorry it took some time, but I want to hand off to Rani at this point. I'm excited to be here with Krishna to fill you in on uh, the laws and regulations of the United States in relation to uh, green cards. Krishna did a terrific job on the work visa. Uh, so what we wanted to do is basically discuss what a green card is and what are the ways to obtain a green card in the United States. So the the fact is um, a green card is an opportunity for an individual 
to permanently live and work in the United States um, while being able to travel pretty much a green card. Um, a green card also provides one certain rights uh, to, to United States benefits. And the benefits include something like uh, social security. If you've paid into the social security system of the United States, that is that you worked here for a certain period of time, you at the age of 65 will be entitled to certain benefits. You also will be entitled to health insurance at a very low cost um, called Medicare. And you also will have lower tuition if you are attending university in the United States. So those are some of the benefits of the green card. And basically, in order to get a green card, there's two ways that you can approach to, to obtain a green card. And one would be, first, you could try through a family member. So if you have an immediate relative who is either a spouse, a parent, or a child of eligible age, uh, then you can be sponsored for a green card. However, the other way, which seems to be uh, the majority of green cards, the way they're issued is through employment. And typically you need to have an employer to sponsor you for the green card. There are a couple of ways to, without, um, without, having, um, without having an employer sponsor you. So um, in terms of the uh, employment-based options, we were discussing that typically you need an employer to sponsor you for the green card. And that's gonna be pretty difficult if you are not in the United States. And certainly if you're on a work visa, as Krishna discussed, an L1, an H1, a TN, or an E2 or E3, you, you would definitely be in a position to be in touch with an employer to sponsor you. However, um, one can also self-petition for a green card. Um, David, if you're, if you're able to share that EB1 slide for me, please, when you get a chance. Oh, it's right there. So then you can go to the first, uh, the next slide. So the EB1A, we're, they're basically four to five categories of green cards and they run EB1, EB1, EB2, EB3, um, and then there's uh, other workers, then there's EB5. Um, the EB1 category is basically available to individuals of extraordinary ability. And the beauty about this category is that you, you don't need to have an employer to sponsor you. And you can actually self-petition. It's a bit of a high standard for the EB1 category uh, because the individual would demonstrate um, a extraordinary ability in, a, in the field of arts, sciences, um, art sciences uh, or any other field, but you, the, as you can see, this is the criterion to demonstrate that, and you have several criterion, almost ten, and how you all you need to do is demonstrate three out of the ten. Um, but if if you have to demonstrate that, the type of award that is required for an EB one A could be a Nobel Peace Prize, it could be an Emmy. Uh, from the entertainment industry or an academy award. So this is a very high standard. You would have to demonstrate that your ability is within the national interest or international interest. And hence, that's, that's, the, that's the EB1A. Um, the next slide, slide, David, please. The second, um, the second category is the EB1B, which is Outstanding Researcher and Professor. And again, if you are that professor or researcher. However, in this time, at these at moving forward, we really need employers to sponsor you. Uh, in, in, this, in this category, you'd need to show that the employer is willing to offer you a permanent position to work in this field. And um, again, you'd have to demonstrate two of the six criterion. And some of that would be, again, major awards, prizes. It would be membership in associations of uh, high stature in your field. It would be uh, publications uh, on your field, in your field, at this high level where you've been recognized as an expert in the field, um, original scientific contributions and whatnot. So that's the second category in, in the EB1 area. The EB1C is for multinational managers or, or individuals of, um, who are executives. 
uh, Krishna talked about the L1 visa. So this is directly correlated to the L1 visa. And if you're on an L1 visa, you can then be sponsored for a green card through your employer. Uh, and again, this is an employer with 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 subsidiaries or has a has has the entity abroad and also started the or has the has the parent or subsidiary in the United States. So if you're already on the L1 visa, you could be sponsored for that. Uh, and typically, uh, that processing time for the EB1 could the EB1C uh, could be many about eight months uh, for the processing and whatnot. In in this instance, I think you know in terms of the L1. Again, you were a manager, you were transferred over, and then the company has continued to prosper and grow, and then the employer is in a position to sponsor you for the green card. Uh, okay. Ronnie, I, I, just have, I just have a quick question on that. So um, if, if I start out with the L1 and I want to get the EB1C, do I have to go home to my home country? and then be brought back for the EB1C, or can it happen all while I'm in the same country? Oh, that's a great question. Um, typically, when you're on a work visa, if it's the H1 or the L1, uh, you are, it's a parallel application, it's a parallel process. So the work visa is you continue to work, and the green card can continue to be processed, can be initiated. So you don't need to travel abroad, but, you know, there's two to three stages in the green card, which we're just about to touch on. And the last stage can take up to 15 to 18 months. Um, and you can choose, instead of doing the, uh, engaging this last stage, which is called the adjustment of status process, where you actually receive your green card, you could actually opt for consular processing for this, and you can cut out a good year. So some people opt to pick up their green card at an interview at the consulate abroad, if they can save a year, a year and a half. So it was, uh, so that's basically what it is. Awesome, thanks. So, great, great. So that's basically the EB1 category in a nutshell. And by far the majority of green cards happen to be through the EB2 category. Um, and the EB2 category is for individuals who possess an advanced degree, which consists of a master's and master's plus one plus years of experience, and or it could be uh, a, a person who possesses a bachelor's plus five years of experience. But once again, you need an employer to sponsor you. You're typically here on an H-1. You're typically here, um, that's that's the primary basis uh, for, the, for, for filing for a green card in this category. Uh, if you don't possess a bachelor's and five years of experience and say you only have a bachelor's and two years of experience, then you would fall under the EB3 category. Uh, the reason why they have these different categories is based on the, the requirements of education. But what does this really mean? How does this really work? Um, there's something called the visa bulletin, which governs the ability and the timeline in which someone can be processed for a green card. And the visa bulletin is issued by the Department of State, and it 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 separates everyone by the num the country that their country of birth that they are on they're from, and um, it basically has it issues green cards to all countries, but the United States has issued green cards to all countries, but some countries such as China, Mexico, the Philippines, China, Mexico, Philippines, and India have applied the most for the green card. So at that point, they have a backlog of a year to several years to receive a green card, which means that if I tell you there's a three-stage process for a green card most normally, and you've cleared stage one, no problem, you can go straight to stage two, which is the I-140, but you can't do stage three unless your visa number is current. Yeah, so basically the time that you file an immigrant petition is, is establishes your priority date. So that's when an employer files the green card for you. Um, and that's the most important date that is viewed at in relation to the visa bulletin. And the visa bulletin will tell you that these four countries might have a specific date at which you, uh, at which you must compare. So the visa bulletin 
as you can see, this is the bulletin that is published every month by the US Department of State that provides critical information on the visa availability for individuals from different countries. As you can see in China, India, Mexico, Philippines, you if you compare the rest of the world is in the first category, all chargeability areas. And that means that for instance, if you did an EB1K, and this is the current visa bulletin for October, 2024. If you had a, um, EB1 case for extraordinary ability, you actually um, you go straight to, uh, it's an immigrant petition being filed. And what it means is that if you are from China, you have, and your, your, your uh, EB1 is approved. And typically I think right now they're about anywhere from eight to 12 to 14 months for an approval. If that's approved, then if today they start that process for a Chinese national, this is September 26, 2024, that person, even if it's approved, say it's a year from now, 2020, uh, it'll be say 2025, October, they would have to look at the fact that they're processing January 2023 dates. That means today they are a year and a half, over a year and a half behind. However, if I pick October 2024 as my priority date, that means that once it's approved, maybe this number would have moved up every month. And maybe I'm getting closer to filing from my adjustment of status, which is my green card, um, my green card application. Anybody have any questions, Krishna, to clear it up? Because I know it's confusing. David, anybody? I just wanted to add something uh, yes. to David's question. David, in, in theory, you don't even have to be on an L1 or a H1 to apply for a green card. Um, for example, I'm just totally an example. If somebody wants to, if you want to move one of your employees from Postalski Paper Products uh, Company in Israel, <laughs> I'm just giving an example. Uh, anyway, you, you have a chief technology officer in Postalski Paper Products, and you want to move that gentleman to US, you don't have, you don't even have to apply for an L1A. You know, you can just apply for an EB1 green card. As you can see from the table that Rani just shared, all chargeability and first category, which is EB1 for all other countries other than the ones listed there, is C, which means it's current, which means this gentleman for whom you want to sponsor green card can typically arrive in the US on a green card, not on an L1, not on a H1. He just goes to the consulate, applies for the green card, arrives in the US on a green card, the whole process end to end might be done in year, year and a half. Great, thank you. Sorry, no problem. So, so, that, so that's the explanation is that, yes, you can get a green card directly, you don't have to be here. But the question is, what is practical? Like if you happen to know some employer is gonna sponsor you, okay, great. Typically for an L1, uh, if they, they know their employees abroad, so that that company in the U.S. So they could very well sponsor the person straight for a green card, definitely. Um, so this is what we we're talking about. This is the visa bulletin. Now, if typically the normal processing uh, uh, for a green card runs three stages, and David, could you go back to the first um, slide? Yeah, perfect. I don't know. Yeah. So this is. If an employer in the United States is sponsoring you for a green card, there are three stages for this green card. Uh, the first stage is the PERM application, which is uh, demonstrating the employer demonstrates to the US Department of Labor that there are no US available US workers for this position. Hence, this worker should be granted a green, should be granted his green card, his or her green card. The fact is that the processing time for the poll perm runs uh, runs approximately nowadays, it's gonna be about a year and a half because prior to filing for this perm process, there is a prevailing wage by the US Department of Labor, which establishes the minimum salary that has to be paid to US to a foreign national. The US Department of Labor wants to ensure that there's no cheap labor, that a foreign national is not being paid uh, anything but what a green card holder should be paid or a citizen of the United States should be paid. So the salary is pretty uh, is competitive. So when then the, the U.S. Department of Labor wants the employer to advertise this position, 
uh, for a period of, there's a recruitment period up to six months. Normally, uh, they process it for two months, and then you file the PERM application. So, and the PERM is now taking about a year. So, all in all, we're talking about a year and a half for this first stage. Now, after this first stage is done, the second stage is the I-140 petition, where the employer must demonstrate they have the financial ability to pay the prevailing wage for that foreign national. And this stage can be as quick as two weeks because there's premium processing, an additional fee where the case can be approved in two weeks. Uh, so that or normal processing. But going back to the visa bulletin, now we, if you clear two stages and you are from the other countries, um, David, can you pull that visa bulletin up please again? It's the next page. So if you've cleared stage one and two, and you are from France, so France falls under all chargeability area except those listed. So that's going to be the first column, of, the first main column with the dates on it. So, and you are an EB2, you have filed under the EB2 category, you had a master's degree and whatnot. And you've, so you've cleared the first stage, the second stage. Can you uh, go ahead and file go for your third stage, which is when you actually get received your green card. So again, France has a backlog from October, 2023. So it's a year of backlog. But if your green card takes you a year and a half anyways, by the time you're done, you can file for adjustment right away. And that's the uh, third stage. Now, if you're from India, and if you're in the EB2 category, we go across and India shows that the priority date that they're working on is January 2013. That's right. Indian nationals have a backlog of about 11 or 12 years at this time. That means if they clear step one and two for that many years, they will not be able to receive their green card. So what happens is if you're on an L1 or if you're on an H1B, you have to keep extending your H1B indefinitely. As long as you've locked in a one-year priority date, that means your firm case was filed and it was approved and you've had it pending for one year. You can keep being here indefinitely for all that time until you go to your last stage. Um, so the last stage of the green card is the adjustment of status application, and this is where you're, you're on your home stretch. You will receive your green card once you file this application. You cannot file this third stage until your priority date is current. You have to go back to the visa bulletin and figure out, depending on which country you're born in, and that's the way it works, basically. Uh, those four countries typically have a backlog. India is actually the greatest backlog at this moment out of all those countries. And um, you can also opt for consular processing if your dates are current. So you don't have the, uh, because the 485 is taking about you know 18 months on average over here in the US. So that's really uh, it in a nutshell in terms of the green card. Um, and uh, it's, it can be a long process. It can be also a shorter process depending on the country you're from. The benefit, however, what's interesting is if you marry, if you're married to a foreign national, say you're an Indian and you marry someone from uh, Switzerland, well, you can use your spouse's country of birth to pop you into a different category so you don't have to wait 12, 13 years. So keep that in mind if you're getting married. Um, oh, so. <laughs> Ronnie, uh, just, uh, to, to, uh, if if you can um, if you can just uh, uh, possibly conclude on what there's like there's like two or three questions in the in the in the chat we want to get to as well. Okay, great. So the last uh, I would like to talk about the green card, the EB five immigrant investor green card. That is uh, a great option for someone with a lot of capital. You need at least uh, it's an immigrant investor program. If you have at least eight hundred thousand dollars U.S or up, up to a million fifty thousand. You can also receive a green card that way because you're investing in the United States economic uh, entities called regional centers. And or if you have a business that you're starting. Um, it's a lot of capital, but if 
you can also have received gifts from for from your family members to accumulate that you could get from uncles, aunts, grandfathers, and whatnot. So that uh, the EB five is um, a process where it takes about there's that's a that's a two stage process. Uh, you file the um, I five twenty six application that takes approximately um, about two and a half to three years at this time. Sometimes it's three to four. So there's a range. But after that's approved, then one can file for adjustment of status. Again, under the visa bulletin, there's a timeline and a backlog. But because it takes three years, typically, once the person has it approved, they can file for adjustment of status just despite the country. It's, it seems to be to work out. So that's for someone with uh, a lot of capital. So um, I think that that's pretty much it, David. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to put you both on spotlight just so that we could uh, maybe answer these questions. I mean, uh, 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 there, there's two that I think are important. The first one is, what visa do you recommend for a lawyer who wants to immigrate to the United States? I mean, I think there was actually somebody on the call. Too. I think there's like somebody on, I think I think she's still on the call too, um, that she's, 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 she's a uh, lawyer from Cuba. But I guess it doesn't matter where they're a lawyer from. But what do you think, Krishna? You want to take a shot at this first? Well, uh, we've done um, H-1B for uh, attorneys, uh, but not exactly um, unless they have a license in the U.S., David. You know that they have to pass the bar and obtain the license and all of that. It becomes challenging. We have done, um, you know, H-1B for a for a foreign legal consultant um, in in the past. Uh, um, it's not exactly, I mean, you have to be very careful about how you uh, strategize and, and, and so on and so forth with regard to the case. And, and we also have to keep in mind who the sponsoring uh, entity is. Is it a law office or is it not a law office? A lot of it depends on that. Uh, then the other visa option that I can think of, which Rani could probably talk because she was going to speak about it, is the O-1 visa category. And uh, Rani, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I sure. Think it might be a good, you know, uh, place to discuss. Right. All. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So, just real quick to add to the L the H one B for a person who is a lawyer from abroad, uh, a lot of law firms um, we've seen and is using the position of a law clerk or a research research associate or a legal assistant along the lines of anyone uh, requiring a bachelor's degree in law. So you can get away with initially starting off, at least if you want to start working um, on the H-1 visa, as he said, as a foreign legal consultant, but you can also be sponsored as a law clerk and then make your step into picking the bar. And then once you pass the bar, then you're, you can then be on H-1B with an, as an attorney. So that's that. Um, in regard to the other options, which are uh, a great uh idea for an individual who does either you you need an employer for this or you don't need an employer so it's a really great option it's the o1 visa for extraordinary ability and under this this option you know we're talking about well-known chefs you're talking about um actors or or international individuals who are at the height of their field it's the ability to demonstrate in a particular field if it's business if it's science if it's um, uh, anything really in any field, uh, the, the, be you, you also have to meet similar criterion that we mentioned, uh, in the EB one for extraordinary ability. It's pretty much the awards and prizes. Have you received noteworthy, uh, awards of national or international interest? Do you have publications about yourself? Do you have media about yourself? Um, uh, also, if you're paid a high salary, that also counts if you're going to be paid a high salary. Um, and if you also, sometimes if you're a business person, it, have you played a critical role in an, in a company? So you only, again, you only need to meet in that regard, you only have to meet three out of the several criterion. And that's the work visa. And you either need an employer, but Again, the great thing about this visa, the O-1, is you don't need an employer. You can actually have an agent, which is a U.S. citizen, file the paperwork for you. They don't have to do anything but just say, okay, yes, we're going to 
we are the agent for this individual in this particular field. And that's good enough to get you uh, into the country and it's good for three years and extendable on indefinitely. Um, but the only thing with the uh, O-1 is, uh, yeah, you just need to have that. You could be with an, uh, you don't need an, uh, an employer to sponsor you. Yeah. But just okay. to recap, David, there yeah, is a different H-1B option as a law clerk or a legal assistant and all of that. You still have to prove that a bachelor's at the very minimum is required. Uh, right. And then there is potentially an O-1 visa possibility. However, keep in mind with H-1B, you're still going with that uh, seven is to one. You know, you have to go through the lottery. We don't know if the case is going to get selected in the lottery or not. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, hurdles that the individual needs to cross. Yeah, good point. I mean, I think in the end, uh, you know, it's uh, not so easy to get into this country anymore, for sure. No, um, okay, what about, there was an interesting question. What about if we wanted to start a business in the States as as Canadians, is it still a TN or a BN visa? I'm not familiar with the... Uh, yeah, what's a BN, a BN visa? Or a TN. Yeah, she wrote. Is it it's still Canadian, TN or BN? She wrote. If it's a Canadian, then they can uh, they they can potentially obtain a TN visa. Uh, they can start a business in the U.S., but they'll have to be a passive investment. They can't make an active investment in a company. So it's going to be a little tricky with them uh, mm -hmm. on a TN and starting a business and actively mm -hmm. operating the business. Because keep in mind, in the schedule of occupations within the the U.S. MCA treaty there are only certain occupations for which you can apply for a TN. And let's say you're applying for, for a management uh, consultant or an engineer TN, and then you, you're in the US starting a business and actively operating, now you're a CEO of a company, it kind of goes against the intent of the visa for which you're applying. So you have to tread that a little carefully. Yeah, um, so listen, there's some really good questions here. We don't have time for all of them, but I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna do one more, but Prahlad and Harshit, please reach out to Krishna or Rani. Um, I think they sent, uh, I, I think they posted their, 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 their information in the chat, but regardless, this is being recorded. We will send it to everybody that has registered, including everybody that's on the call. We will share their slides and we will share their contact, oh, maybe not all their slides, but we will share their contact information. That's the most important thing. So just one more question I think is really important. Is there a startup visa? I can't run a startup on H-1B. So what's my options after F-1? And is my startup that I lost me there? And is my startup um, doing F one in the same category as my studies? I'm not sure if you understand the question, but yeah, so I don't understand the question. Don, you want to take this or? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, we do get these sorts of questions a lot, and if first off, if an individual is on a visa and they purport to be a student, they have to only engage in that activity. If they step out of that in any way, uh, then they violate status. Now, you can be sponsored from an F1 to an H1B through a company. Now, there is some separation between the H1B uh, where you could still have some major role in the company, but it has to be owned and uh, there has to be a separate governance of that company by different members or different body uh, uh, directors. And then you can still be an uh, integral part of that company. So that is something that can be done. It's very, I would say it's a little difficult to demonstrate. A lot of people, as I think that Krishna has seen, that we have all seen, is that they have their friends own the company and uh, somehow it works out where the individual is sponsored on the company, and but he, he or she is an integral part of the company. So there's ways to get around things as long as we stick and follow the laws because we don't want to show any violation of status. You can't be on H-1B with a company that you think is yours or, and yours and then, and then um, act like you're the president. If you violate that, then you're out of status. The USCIS will find this and they will uh, deny your case. We've had many individuals who do 
who have, uh, oh, they started their own company while on H-1B, um, while they were on H-1B with another company, and then open their own company, and then run that company, and the USCIS down the road, when they're filing for their last page of the green card, will say, you opened this company up, you and your wife, and you acted as so-and-so, denied, green card denied. So it's a very dangerous and, you know, careful line that you have to follow in, in abiding the laws of the United States. And why you need attorneys, right, to help you with this stuff, for sure. <laughs> Darn right. Darn right is right. Krishna, uh -huh. did you want to, um, um, did you want to maybe see one, uh, 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 Ronnie, I'll ask you the same thing. Just take a look at the questions that are at the end. Krishna, did you want to answer one of them? If so, just read it out loud and then just answer it if you can. Yeah, I mean, you know, the with regard to the uh, question from Kanav, uh, I, I, I'm guessing I'm saying that name correctly, uh, Kanav Agarwal, as Rani mentioned, you could potentially, I mean, it's it's a very valid question. You know, you could be an in, in, inventor of something and or a product or a technology, and you want to uh, sort of, sort of like start a company and and you know have your footing in the in the in the country with regard to applying for a H one B and all of that. But as Rani mentioned, you have to be very careful with how you structure this. You need, I mean, you can potentially apply for a H one B. Uh, through a company that you sort of like, uh, you know, formed or established, but you need to have independent board of directors. You can't have any, uh, you know, control over the operations of the company and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, so that that's that. Uh, but we can discuss more in detail. Um, either Rani or I, you can reach out to us directly. Um, and Rani, there is a question from Harshit Singhal with regard to being on H4 EAD, and uh, as an independent consultant uh, in IT, uh, under my own form, can I be eligible for an EB-5? Uh, there, is, there is no restriction to apply for an EB-5 green card if you're on a H-4 EAD. I don't think there's any issues there. Uh, Rani, you see? Yeah, you're correct. You're correct. There's no restriction. If you've got the money, you can get an EB-5. Yes. Okay, so that means we only have one. I think we have two questions left. Maybe if 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 the two of you wanna wanna answer it, let me know. Um, it's that one from Prahlad. Can we extend L one B indefinitely via I one forty route? Do you see that? Can I? There's probably a lot to unpack over there. Uh, but, uh, um, I'm trying to find just, that question actually. Just go up on the on the chat a little bit. It's from. Oh, you know what? Maybe they sent it to me directly. Sorry. Can we extend oh. L1B indefinitely via I-140 route? Can my spouse start an LLP here in the U.S. and go for EB-1 without the LLP making profit but generating revenue? David, have him re uh, reach out to either Rani or me on that. Uh, yeah. You need to understand the question carefully before we say anything. Good uh, point. Yeah. But in, in reality... Uh, you know, uh, I don't exactly understand the question, but I need to look at it more carefully. In reality, you can apply for a green card uh, being on an L1. Um, and I don't know if he's talking about uh, applying for a, maybe easy on, on the call. Maybe he can ask the question live. David, you're muted. He dropped, he dropped. I don't see him on the call. Right. Yeah, I'm there. Hey, oh, you do yeah, Okay, um, go for it. Yeah, it's a, uh, so I'm on L1B. My spouse uh, is on dependent visa, L2S. So the thing is, uh, is it like uh, can we can we extend L1B indefinitely, like uh, via you know perm and I140 route, or it is like three plus two only for L1B because L1A. Yeah, the, I understand the question. Unfortunately, with regard to extending the green card beyond the maximum period of five years. Even with a, a approved I-140 and a perm and all of that, um, it won't give her the benefit of continuity of uh, stay in the U.S. Uh, like the like it works with the H-1B. She still has to leave the country. She could preserve the priority date with the perm filing and all of that, but it won't give her the continuity of stay in the U.S. She'll have to leave the country, reset the uh, you know the clock uh, by staying outside for one year before she re-enters U.S. on an L-1A or an L-1B. She can still keep the priority date, but it's not going to benefit her by getting, uh, you know, infinite number of extensions. Um, but what is her, she's on L1, you said? L1B. Right. So she could, yeah, if you've maxed, but if you switch to an H1B, but I, you can't switch to an H, yeah, you can switch to an H1B then maybe. 
So, but my spouse, let's say, start, uh, st starts LLP here, startup, and we generate revenue. We had a company in India, and it was generating revenue. And then in COVID, we shut down the company operationally. But SaaS product is there. So now, the thing is, we want to start here. So let's say in a couple of years, we don't make profit, but we, we are generating revenue from that product. Can we uh, stay here somehow, like applying EB1? category or something my spouse because a spouse can start anything right wait so what is your status l1b and my spouse oh. l2s she's the l2 yeah you can she can start any if she's got the ead then she can start any company and True. work on it yep yep but if... but you're limited by your time in the country uh but yes but yes, she can start any company on the EAD. Does the question that he's yes, asking, EAD? seems like, uh, Rehla, the, I think the question that you're asking is, can your wife do her own L1A and an EB1 through her own company, right? That, okay, so two things, actually. One is, I, I think, answer for the first one, I got the answer, like, L1B extension is not feasible, right? Yes. Even if my I-140 route. Now there's another situation, actually. It's only my possible wife if is... she has a 485 file, but other than that, no. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then it is possible on L1B as well, right? If... Well, if you, if you file a 485, like, let's say, I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, okay. the priority date becomes current for, for a magical reason, whatever. The priority date becomes current. Uh, she and you file the 485 application, adjustment application. That, in and of itself, gives you the... Uh, the privilege of staying in the country, you can apply mm -hmm. for EDD, you can apply for advanced parole, travel document, all of that. But it won't extend the L1 beyond the maximum allocated time. There is no regulation that uh, extends the L1 just because you have an ongoing green card. Okay, got it, got it. But, with regard, to, but with regard to your wife applying for an EB1 green card and all, we need to understand more facts. Uh, as, as Rani mentioned, you know, it's probably better that you... Uh, either reach out to her or me offline, and we'll be happy to, you know, do uh, have a consultation with you on that. Okay, sure, sure. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank final you. thoughts, Rani? I have a question. Final thoughts. Um, I think that I think that the coverage was great, um, and it's. I hope that it was informative, and I I think there's many options that just need to be explored. You know, you really have to just discuss your facts and then see see what where you fit in. So it's definitely an attainable goal for anyone to work or obtain a green card in the U.S. Amazing, okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thoughts. And my my thoughts on on immigration for entrepreneurs is there are um, you know there are visa options available uh, to temporarily come to U.S. Uh, to either establish a company. Or, or uh, you know, or, or so on and so forth uh, in the U.S. with regard to various uh, temporary visa options. But there are also options, as Rani mentioned, there are green card options for you to permanently immigrate to U.S. Um, uh, whether it's an O-1 visa or, or having your own company in the U.S. on an L-1. So, you know, uh, you should explore those possibilities if you're looking to immigrate to U.S. Awesome. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Krishna. Never awesome. enough time for any topic that I we do. I encourage David, every, you. you're welcome. I encourage everybody to reach out to Krishna and Ronnie. Uh, you'll, you'll have their contact information. I know there's some questions we didn't get to, but I think the, I think the questions itself illustrate that this is a, 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 a this can be a complicated process if not handled by an attorney and a professional. So please reach out. Thank you, everyone, for joining this month's Entrepreneurial Strategy Series. Look out for the recap and the video, and uh, we will be back in November. Um, I'm sorry, we'll be back in October, and uh, and and uh, we'll be seeing all of you there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for hanging in Thank there. Thank you. Thanks, Krishna. Bye. Thanks. Thank Thanks, Dave. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.